Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the presentation, Selling Solar Plus Storage Solutions with Confidence, part one. So this is a part one of a two-part series. Uh, the second part will uh, be presented next Friday at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, before we begin, if you're experiencing any te technical difficulties, please notify me by typing in your question in the question section of your control panel on the right-hand side of your screen and, and clicking send. I'll then be able to see your message and uh, uh, make any adjustments that we can make on our end. We will have a question and answer session following the presentation. You're welcome to submit your questions at any point during the webinar, and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible after the presentation. Any that we're unable to get to, we will uh, follow up with an email directly to you. There will also be a brief survey that will pop up in, the, in a new window immediately following the webinar. Uh, please take a couple minutes and complete it, and once you do, we will email you a copy of this presentation. So if there are no questions, I'd like to introduce our presenters, our presenters today. We've got Josh Brister and Brad Bassett. Josh is our Senior Manager of Product, market, or product Management, Technical Sales and Marketing here at AE Solar. And Brad is our Senior Applications Engineer with a long history in off-grid solutions. Brad and Josh, I'm uh, passing the presentation over to you. Excellent, thanks, Jamie, and thanks Thanks everybody for joining us on a, what's hopefully a nice, beautiful Friday for you. Um, yeah, wanted to welcome everybody and, and um, give a little background on, on kind of why we're here and, and what we wanted to talk about today. Um, in, in putting this webinar together, uh, this, has been a, this has been a topic in the back of my mind for, for years now, really. And that's, and that's that as, as solar plus storage is, is heading, you know, is at the mainstream or heading towards the mainstream, I guess, depending on your perspective, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a fundamental process change that I think needs to happen for this to, to really kick off. Uh, and there's, you know, a couple of things that I think about in this, in this paradigm and the, the adage that what got you here won't get you there, I think really rings true to me. Um, you know, up, up until a few years ago, solar plus storage was a, um, you know, a really cool solution that was understood by few and, and you know, practiced or, or um, experienced by even fewer. Um, and, you know, the, the way that we've been accustomed, I think, to, to selling and designing and quoting solar plus storage um, in terms of doing a, a detailed on-site analysis and a load study is uh, that's the that's the what got us here part. And that's not what's going to get us there um, in terms of the the. The, the world we're living in today where it's it's harder than ever to to do an on-site visit and an, an on-site consultation and a load study um you know that that's a blocker for for you know, a lot of installations um if we want to get this to mainstream and be able to you know be able to quote this and and get it out in front of customers at the same rate we can we can present customers with offers for grid tied solar We've got to just refine our sales process and really narrow in the offer. Because um, what's clear is the, the back and forth that I see so often of, you know, Mr. Installer, tell me what this is going to cost. Well, Mr. Customer, I can't do that until we figure out what, you know, what we need to back up and what it's going to do. Well, Mr. Installer, um, that sounds great, but I, I need to know how much it's going to cost before I can tell you what my priorities are. That back and forth, you know, that kind of, you know, I'm an Excel guy, so the circular reference for me. Um, that's the biggest blocker, I think, to, to moving forward and, and getting solar plus storage more accessible to more homeowners. So that's why we're here. Um, my, my goal in putting together this two-part webinar series was, um, you know, I think, I think we all understand that this, this needs to become easier and, and more simplified for homeowners. Uh, and that's a really easy statement to make. You know, it's really easy for me to say, and, you know, my little marketing desk here at AE Solar, like, you know, we should just make this easy. This should be foolproof. Um, it's a lot harder to do. So what we've done is break this into, into two sections. And what we really want to focus on today is um, narrowing the offer, making a, a, a simplified standard kind of offer for, for installers to, to put out in front of customers. Uh, and then next week, what we're really going to focus in on is, you know, having done the homework on selecting the offer, 
what are some things you can do with your sales process to make it simpler for more people to, to quote and, and, and speak to customers about these kinds, these kinds of systems. Um, and, you know, gear all of your marketing and sales actions and, and content and incentives on um, really just increasing the volume. I think that's the biggest thing is if we can get more quotes out there that are meaningful and easier to understand for homeowners, we're, we're bound to sell more systems. It's, um, you know, just like Gridside Solar, it's, it's a numbers game. Uh, if you want to close five deals this week, you know, you better get out and talk to 50 customers. Um, to get 50 customers on the phone, you better have, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, 300 leads. Uh, it becomes a numbers game. And if we can make it simpler to, for customers to understand and interpret, you know, we're bound to have better success. So our specific agenda today uh, is going to be, you know, the overall process and, and thinking about this as, you know, you know, mass customization rather than made to order. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of the standardized offer. Um, I'll give you guys some marketing background on, on you know, why a three-tiered approach works for most businesses. And then we're going to dig into some, you know, some tough technical questions on how do you know what's going to work in your area? And for that, you know, there's, <laughs> there's nobody I think is more qualified to speak to this than, than Brad. Um, Brad has probably, yeah, I won't say probably, Brad has forgotten more about solar plus storage than I've probably known. So, uh, you know, he's our on-site expert and we're, we're really happy to have him. Uh, so we'll walk through the kind of a solution selection process. And the, the goal here is not for us to tell you, Mr. Installer in you know, Colorado, you need to sell these three things. What we're trying to do is lay out a framework so that, you know, with some, with some workshopping, with some thought process, you can ask yourself some questions and, and really hone in on a, you know, a, a two-tiered or a three-tiered offer that's going to work for your team. So that's our goal today. And I uh, appreciate you guys being here with us. And, and hopefully we, uh, you know, we achieve that standard for you. The last thing here, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, mention this, is you, you may be asking yourself, why are there so many pictures in today's presentation? And the short answer to that is, like a lot of you, I've been uh, sheltering in place and homebound for um, going on three months now. And, you know, I'm just really looking forward to some different scenery. So we, uh, we dug up some pictures from our, um, these are customer installs submitted to us last year for, um, uh, in a contest we ran to, to, to get some installer pictures into our catalog. So happy to share all these today. Um, if you're on, if you're here with us on the phone or um, online and these are one of your installs, you know, we're, <laughs> we're really happy to have had them and to have, to have had you share these with us. So we got a lot to get through. Uh, with that said, uh, let's get kicked off. Uh, crossing the chasm is a phenomenon I like to, to kind of harken back to that, um, really what we're getting at here is the, is the jump or the chasm we've got to get across to get from early adopters to, to mainstream. Um, on the left is a, is a technology adoption cycle. And, and this, is a, this is a paradigm um, kind of written up and, and, um, and explained by, by Jeffrey Moore in, in uh, a lot of his academic writings. But what, what we talk about here is that, you know, the adoption life cycle seems like it should be a, you know, a relatively linear uh, process. That if you can get innovators to help you beta test the product and you can get, you know, version one out in front of early adopters, um, that, you know, they will tell their friends and viral marketing magic will happen somehow. And then the early majority will, of course, want to use this product. Um, in real life, it's a lot harder than that. And there's a chasm between early adopters and the early majority. And it, 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 it's kind of like I mentioned on that first slide that what, what got you here won't necessarily get you there. And it's a different type of marketing needed to get new technology and new solutions out to the early majority. Uh, and that's really where I think we are in a lot of places in the country with solar plus storage, that it's um, you know, people have heard about it for a while now. You know, they've, they've probably seen some social media of people they may or may not know with power walls and LG Chem and um, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but there's just more importantly, there's not a really clear understanding of what the solution is and, and why it's needed. And that's what we're really targeting today is how do we make it easier for you as installers and salespeople to help your customers cross the chasm to get, you know, to get a solution that's previously been uh, a, a widgety, gadgety kind of thing. You know, how do we get this mainstream? So that's the goal for today. 
one of the ways that I think um, we can help make this a lot easier for customers to install and evaluate and, and you know, ultimately make purchase decisions on, because that's, that's what we're here for, is to have a, a, a standardized offer um, that you can put in front of a customer and say, we've done the homework, we've kind of run all the numbers, not specific to you, but you know, we know our market and we know that we've got a good offer, a better offer, and a best offer. Um, this comes down to choices and, and there's a lot of behavioral psychology that goes into this, but uh, and if, if, you, if you see me at a, uh, at, a, at a trade show or you know, you're interested in following up on this, I've got some, some really interesting examples to this, but um, you know, basically what it boils down to is, is you know, being prescriptive and defining the offer. And if you, if you do it in such a way that there's a, a clear you know, segmentation or um, you know, tiering to your offers, makes it easier for customers to understand the trade-offs. And in, in doing a three-tiered offer, what the research says is you're more likely to get people into an upgrade package or a, um, a more premium offer by giving them trade-offs. And particularly with two versus three, three's been shown to, uh, to get more people into the, into the mid-grade or the better offer. Um, I think a lot of this boils down to the psychology around Nobody wants to be seen as, as cheap. So when given an option of, of two items, you'll get a lot of pragmatists who will get the, you know, the, the lower tiered item. When you give them three choices, however, it uh, becomes a little more conspicuous that they've opted for the cheapest of the three. Uh, so you see this time and again with consumer goods. You see it on um, you know, wine lists at restaurants. A lot, of, uh, a lot of solid marketing behind this. And it's, it's one of the things I like to try to rely on in, in these types of discussions. Um, so just some background kind of marketing speak for you in terms of how, what's, what's the goal here? Is the goal to just say, I've got one storage offer, take it or leave it? Uh, no, I mean, I think, I think we all understand that if you provide people choices, you're able to kind of call it price harvest, you're able to get um, the right offer to the right people at the right price, um, and you provide them some, some options. Now, I've, I've included here a link to some follow-up reading on choice overload, there's plenty of examples that show that too many choices are debilitating and um, you know cause customers to um, to fall out of the funnel. And I, I've certainly seen this um, uh, in my own personal life. So some good follow-up reading there. We'll keep working here because there's a there's a lot of content. So um, we've talked a little bit about you know the need to make this more standardized and the need to you know put this into a, a, a tiered offering. Um, at this point, what we really need to start to do is, is, is understand our market and figure out how we can narrow in. Uh, and I've got a graphic here on the side that's, um, that's uh, some good kind of marketing fundamentals on um, ways to slice your market and ways to, ways to segment. So if we were to think about um, the writing instrument market, um, you know, our, our total available market would be anybody who ever writes anything um that goes onto any surface you know really broadly um the next you know the next slice of the market might be the product available market so how many of those possible customers are available to us given the you know the offer of the solution we have so if we're if we're not an, a writing instrument company we're specifically a, a crayon company that's really going to narrow the market even further um the next kind of zoom in or click click down is going to be served available market. So how many of those folks do we have access to given, you know, our marketing and our sales channels? So taking it one step further, if we're a, a crayon manufacturing company, but um, we only, let me think of a good example here, you know, we only sell in supermarkets. That really shrinks our, our served available market. Um, so this is thinking for us to think about how do we, how do we look at the entire landscape of our, you know, our, our service geography or, or the, the network that we've got, um, the, the sales network we have. How do we look at that entire landscape and really kind of focus in uh, on what's, what's going to move the needle? So um, questions we can ask ourselves, you know, to define the market broadly and then get more specific. Um, lots of big fundamental ones, but what we're going to focus on first is, uh, is um, that this gets to the use case of solar plus storage. Is, is time of use or, or self-supply, is this a reasonable concern for homeowners? 
Uh, and I've got here my own rule of thumb of what, you know, what the delta between peak and off-peak should be, needs to be to, to justify this arbitrage. So that's one really fundamental question you can ask about your territory. Um, I see a lot of folks struggle with this. How large is the retrofit market in your area, really? And we're going to get down the line to, answer, to asking ourselves questions about, you know, AC coupling versus DC coupling and standalone versus like a full platform. Um, in order to answer those questions down the road, we really have to ask ourselves now, how large or significant is this, is this market to us really? Um, you know, if I'm, uh, if I'm an installer in, in North Dakota and I want to put together a solar plus storage offer, I may not really need to worry about how large that installed base is and how much retrofit opportunity there is um, versus, you know, the San Francisco Bay Area. There's a lot more installed base of, you know, solar only homes to go after with a retrofit offer. So just some, some fundamental questions to ask about your market. Um, the last category is, is housing stock. So it's, um, there, there used to be a lot more resources for, for understanding the housing stock and, you know, how they were aging and when houses on, on average were built in your area. Uh, it's a little harder to find some of that stuff now, but, you know, I think, I think most of us understand the, you know, the geographies we're in and what, you know, what average homes look like. Um, so roughly speaking, what's the average service size? Are you in an area where 200 and 400 amp services are plentiful and things like main panel upgrades are just not a concern? Um, or are you in, you know, one of these Northeastern areas where, everybody's maxes out at a 125 amp panel and anybody doing large systems with backup is going to have a, a main panel upgrade. That's a, that's one of these really important steering questions we've got to think about. Uh, another, for example, is going to be average system size. You know, how much, how much PV, you know, realistically is available to most, to most roofs. Uh, and you see wide, you know, wide varieties of, of average system sizes around the country. Some of that's going to be budgetary. Some of that's going to be, you know, roof space and orientations and, and load driven. But so it's a good kind of guiding metric for us on how do we understand our market? How do we build, you know, a, a one, size, one size fits most kind of offer? So really good, you know, fundamental questions to ask about our market before we can do any of the, you know, um, kind of hypotheticals on what the, what the offer needs to be. Um, I call this slide kind of defining the playing field and, and I just wanted to show kind of our um, kind of our thoughts here on, on how we go about narrowing the field. Um, in, in, a, in a normal instance or in, in theory, this is a linear process on the left where we define the use case. Um, we define, you know, what we're calling the platform. So, you know, what's the architecture or the, or the application we're trying to we're trying to utilize, uh, and then we'll dive into specific products. You know, I, I'll give you an example. I know that I want to target a, a you know an eight kilowatt AC coupled system that's capable of backup, um, and I know I want to use uh, end phase. That's where we'll hone in and, and decide like this is the sample build material that we're going to quote out, and we're going to figure out what our adders are based on you know this really defined set of hardware. So that's in theory. And one of my favorite uh, Yogi Berra-isms is, uh, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. Well, in practice, there is. Um, I think for the purposes of what we're going to talk about today, you know, we need, to be, uh, we need to be comfortable with the idea that this is going to be a linear process, that we're going to, you know, we're going to define a set of use cases and we're going to think about platform technologies. Um, and specific products, and and maybe then at that point we're gonna um, we're gonna iterate and we're gonna start over. Or it could be that you're an installer who's you know really brand loyal and you want to only offer uh, things that are going to align with you know what you um, what you and your teams really like to install. So in that case, you might start at specific products and work backwards. Um, there's plenty of ways to skin a cat, and uh, it's not for us to say the right way to go about doing this. Um, if you're able to do this in a linear fashion, great. Um, if like me, it's more iterative and there's a lot of back and forth, you know, that's okay too. Um, so at this point, we've got some really fundamental questions about the system and, and what, it, what we'll need it to do. And, and for that, I'm going to, I'm going to call in the expert here. I'm going to call on Brad to start laying out, you know, how do we define the use case and, and what comes next? Thank you, Josh. 
Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit more of the technical nitty gritty here and um, some of the different use cases for storage uh, in a solar system. And uh, we can start right off with um, what are some of the local uh, rules and, and uh, utility tariffs and the like that are going to determine what type of uh, purpose you have for adding storage to the solar. Um, things like, you know, do, does your area have net metering available um, or are there time of use tariffs, um, you know, where the power is a different price at different times of the day or maybe there's no feed in tariff or at all, or maybe it's they only pay you a small fraction of what you feed back into the utility. Um, these are things that are going to be very different from one location to another. Um, and part of what will determine what kind of systems you're going to want to offer. Um, and of course, um, you know, you have to determine, does your customer want backup power? You know, a lot of many customers, maybe even most customers with solar are, end up not being happy if the solar system does not work during a utility outage. Um, and see a, a large value in having uh, that system work during an outage to give them some power. And also you need to keep in mind that, you know, backup power generally does require a backup loads panel, which requires some extra work um, in order to um, set the system up uh, so that they can have backup loads. Um, although some people do want the whole house backup. I mean, a lot of people want the whole house backup, but you'll have to determine, you know, at what price point um, do they, do, can you offer that uh, to them? And then, you know, what, where does self-supply um, give value to um, adding storage to a system? Um, you know, is it required because net metering is not allowed or is there an economic value to time of use or limited value of the feed in? Um, and, or peak load charges. And this is gonna be, um, <clears throat> make a, a difference in what your offer is going to be to people uh, by your locality. Um, some people also um, just want self-supply, uh, either because they think it's necessary or because they want to, um, or they have a certain brand that they want, uh, or maybe just, you know, they want lithium batteries because that's the latest, greatest thing. Um, some people want to just simply go off grid and you know, off-grid is a form of self-supply, um, but off-grid really could be just if the grid is not available at all at the location and a true off-grid system would be a really a different discussion than what we're going to look at today. Um, and you'll have to work with a, a customer who thinks he wants to go off-grid because if he has utility available, he probably does not want to because uh, there's really no financial or environmental benefit to going off grid if you have the grid available. Um, it would be more of a political decision. Okay. Next slide. So to, to get a little bit more detailed, um, if you're in a location where net metering is not available, that means that there is utility service to the site but they do not allow you to feed power back into the utility at all. Um, and so this means that all the solar that you produce on site is going to have to be consumed on the site, uh, self-consumed or self-supply. Um, and that's going to uh, determine, you know, what type of systems uh, that you can um, offer uh, in your area. Uh, another um, type of, of system is low feed-in tariff rates. In other words, the utility company will allow you to feed your solar power back into the utility, um, but it's not at the same value that you uh, use electricity from the utility. Um, they, they will, they generally have a meter that, that meters both directions and you know, they charge you, say, 12 cents kilowatt hour for power that you use. But when you feed power back into their grid, they only pay you three or four cents a kilowatt hour for that power. Um, and that 
may self-supply uh, have a pretty good financial advantage um, to be able to use that solar uh, rather than just terminating the solar when you don't have enough load to use it. Uh, there's also time of use rates or demand charges. <clears throat> and this is where utility service, well, time of use rates would be a form of net metering. In other words, during the middle of the day, if you feed power into the grid, it's at the same value that you would use power from the grid. And it's generally at a lower rate than what you would get in the evening where the rates are higher, where what you pay from the grid is higher and what you would feed into the grid would be higher. But of course, in the evening, there is no solar to feed into the grid. Um, and so this is sort of similar to um, the low feed-in tariff. In other words, you're, you're feeding it in at a lower value than you're, than you're getting it back out. Um, and and self-supply will help balance that out so that you can take advantage of your storage rather than and, and, and mitigate some of that charge difference between the time of day. Uh, there's also rate structures where um, you just simply have a higher uh, cost of energy when you're drawing over a certain amount of energy per month or a certain power level. Um, and storage can, can mitigate that to some extent also or a combination of these also can, can happen. Okay. So this is just sort of a typical load profile of a of self-supply system. And this could be used uh, either with, with no net metering or with time of use. Uh, any of those could look similar to this. Uh, and as you go from midnight on the left side through the day, middle of the day, and, and to back to midnight on the right side of this uh, graphic, um, you can see that, that um, the blue lines are, are your loads, and your loads are being powered by the battery, and the battery is, that black line is slowly being discharged to the point where, ideally, at, at eight or nine in the morning when there's solar uh, available, the solar will then take over powering the loads, and also be excess uh, power during the middle of the day, which will recharge the battery. And so you'll be powering the loads and recharging the batteries during most of the day. And then, you know, getting towards evening, the sun is going down, the sun will not be, the solar will not be available to charge uh, the batteries or, or power the loads. And then you'll start running off of your battery bank to power your loads. Um, this is particularly effective when you have you know, high peak rates in the evening because uh, you're now running off the battery, which was charged from the sun instead of paying the higher rates in the evening. Okay. <clears throat> so um, getting into still more detail on the use case of backup power with a net metering location. So net metering means that you are able to take all your solar power feed it into the grid, uh, although actually normally it feeds into your loads first and then into the grid. Um, and you can pull that power back out from the grid at the same rate, same cost that you have gotten credit for feeding it into the grid. Um, so <clears throat> generally what you're looking for here is uh, using your storage for backup power and the, the energy storage will stay fully charged you know, 24 seven until there's a power outage. Um, and we can and we can separate this into uh, new systems and retrofit systems. And either one of those could be AC or DC coupled. Um, in a new installation, I'll go through those first. Um, in a DC coupled system, this is your traditional system, grid tie battery backup system. It's been around for a couple of decades now. Um, so it's more the, the more traditional design. Um, it is very robust for your backup power um, because a lot of this stuff was designed originally as off-grid equipment. And so it does really well when, you're, when the utility's not there and you're off-grid. Um, it's not so efficient for grid tie um, because what happens is you've got the solar array feeding a charge controller, which is charging your battery, and then when that battery gets up to its nearly fully charged voltage, the battery inverter will start taking that energy, excess energy, and, and it'll start feeding it into your loads to prevent that battery from getting any higher voltage. 
and after it's fed your loads and, and your household loads, and eventually if you have enough solar power, it'll feed back into the grid. Um, so it's it takes a while for all of this to sort of get to the point where it's actually feeding AC power into, into your loads in the grid. Um, and, and there's a lot more going on in that equipment so that the efficiency is somewhat lower, um, particularly at very low light levels. Um, you know, the, the, a lot of these inverters will need to have, you know, one or 200 watts of solar available before it really starts feeding into the AC. Um, whereas a regular grid tie inverter, yeah, I mean, my micro inverters will start feeding into my into the grid at four watts each. Um, you know, and the, 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 the old battery grid tie inverter will not even be looking at anything at that level of power. If you're in a sunnier area, it's not a big, it's not as, not as big a deal. If you're in a place like mine in Olympia, Washington, um, you know, the, it, all winter we've got low light and it can make a, a difference in how much uh, solar you actually end up using. The other option is to go to AC coupled. And AC coupled is where you have a regular grid tie inverter or in micro inverters or optimized uh, modules inverters that are, that feed the grid directly. And to give you backup power, you then add a battery inverter so that when the utility goes down, the backup inverter takes over and acts like your microgrid uh, at your location. And the grid tie inverter will then see this as, as the new grid and it will start feeding into that and supplying energy into your battery inverter. And the battery inverter will be supplying power to your backup loads. Um, and of course, it does have to separate itself from the grid um, and then power only the backup loads. Um, because of course, it is not allowed to feed power back into the grid when the grid is down. And, you know, anti-islanding is, is something that we've probably all been familiar with for many decades. Um, since the grid tie inverters have been meeting um, the new UL standard, the 1741 SA, which is the smart grid um, standard. It allows, it, it actually requires grid tie inverters to respond to frequency shift. Um, and the battery inverters, at least some of them now, have frequency shift built into them so that when you are off grid, you know, when the utilities grid is down, the battery inverter can control the grid tie inverter um, rather than just turning it on and off. It can now control the grid tie inverter. And when the batteries are full and you, you're, you're powering all your loads and the power's out um, and there's more solar power available, instead of shutting off the grid tie inverter, it will actually just change the frequency and the grid tie inverter will back off on its power and, and match the power that you need for your loads. Um, this makes for a much smoother operating system that works a lot better than, than what we had a few years ago. Um, the rapid shutdown then is just part of your grid tie inverter system, uh, you know, whether it's microinverters or DC optimizers or, you know, uh, sun spec uh, devices. Um, and that can be uh, less expensive and less complex than, than some of the systems that are necessary for a DC coupled system. Um, and actually, even though you have two different inverters, um, in, in some cases, it can actually be the same, similar or lower cost than a DC coupled system these days. Uh, a large part of that is the, is the rapid shutdown devices for the DC coupled systems are not as, as advanced at this point. Uh, some of them and the equipment to use them is, is in many cases more expensive. Um, so, um, but it depends on the size of the system. You know, I mean, it, they, they leapfrog each other. You know, well, if it's a 24 module system, the AC coupled might be cheaper. If it's a 20 module system, the DC coupled might be cheaper. Uh, but they're all very similar in cost at this point. The disadvantage of an AC coupled system <clears throat> is that you do have two different brands of inverters for the most part. And, you know, if you have a battery inverter, <clears throat> And you have a grid tie inverters not synchronizing to it when the power is off, you know, when the utility is down, um, you know, who's going to help you figure out what's going on there? The battery inverter manufacturer is going to say, well, it's producing power, right? That's what we do. 
And the grid tie inverter manufacturer is going to say, well, we connect to the grid, right? And we are not really made to connect to another inverter. Um, and in which case you sort of get stuck with, you know, <laughs> it doesn't work. <clears throat> and what do you do? And that can be mitigated somewhat with known equipment. You know, there's there's certain brands of grid tie inverters that we know work with with the battery inverters and some that that may not work as well, and, and you just need to um, suss that out and figure out which ones you know you should go with and which ones are are, are more likely to be an issue. And I'll just um, make a note here. I always like to 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 have just a, a little bit of a talk about batteries in, a, in this type of system where the batteries in these are always being kept at a full state of charge. You're not cycling the batteries except during a utility outage. Um, and AGM, or actually I should say VLRA, um, valve regulated, valve regulated lead acid batteries, which includes AGM and gel, um, batteries are, are ideal for backup power. Um, the gels are the cost of the extra cost of a gel battery is probably not worth it, but AGM batteries are are just great for backup power. They've been used for backup power for a long time. Um, we have batteries, you know, like the Deca Unigy 2 that are known to last up to 20 years in this type of use. Um, even the smaller batteries that we have, um, some of them are expected to last up to 15 years in this type of use. And even a even just a regular high, you know, good quality AGM battery should last 10 years um, in this type of use. Um, but most of these battery, most of these battery inverters do run at 48 volts. There's a few at 24 volts. Um, so you can really use almost any 48 volt battery bank. Um, flooded batteries have severe disadvantages for this. They don't like to be kept at float. They don't, they use a lot of energy to keep them at float. Um, you have to have ventilation, isolation, spill control, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas an AGM battery will take almost no energy to keep it fully charged and they're sealed, there's no maintenance, et cetera. Um, you can also use the lithium iron phosphate batteries, which are available in 48 volts. Um, whether they would last longer than, you know, the top quality AGM is still sort of an open question. And of course, they are quite a bit more expensive. Um, so they're, they may, you can use them if you want. Uh, they're, they're certainly a premium choice, but they may not be. Uh, it would be hard to justify in, in this type of system. Okay, next. And continuing with this, there is a new sort of um, class of, of energy storage system and uh, grid tie with energy storage. Um, and these are systems that are pre-engineered um, to have both a grid tie and storage um, and, and, and are often um, um, listed to UL 9540, which is a new UL standard with a, a pre-engineered complete system. Um, and these are really oriented towards the market of, of, of um, self-supply and self-consumption, um, you know, for, for the other types of systems. But uh, there are certainly a number of people using them just for simply uh, net meter grid tied with battery backup systems. Um, and they do work for that. Um, and they are generally uh, only available with lithium ion storage. And that is because the lithium ion is the best financial um, choice when you're doing a self-supply type system. Um, and so a lithium ion battery is, is, your, is your automotive type LG, uh, Tesla, um, Panasonic type uh, battery as, as opposed to the lithium iron phosphate, which is more of an off-grid type of, of lithium battery, uh, which is more expensive. So these <clears throat> um, batteries would generally have a 10 year warranty. They will probably last longer than that in a backup situation, um, but we don't know how much longer. So you're looking at a battery that maybe lasts 10, 15 years, um, and they don't necessarily like to be kept at 100% state of charge all the time, um, but I think some of the inverters will allow them to be kept at a little bit lower than, than 100%, uh, so that it'll enhance their lifetime. They're really made to be cycled a lot. 
um, and you can cycle them every day and they're still warranted for 10 years. Um, that's it for new installations. For retrofit installations, a retrofit installation means a system where you already have an existing uh, PV direct solar system. You, you've got an inverter or, or microinverter or whatever that's a grid tied system existing on the house or the site. And your customer wants battery backup um, associated with that. And um, there's, there's two ways of doing this. One is to put in a battery inverter, um, AC couple it to the grid tie inverter, sort of like what we talked about for new systems, um, or simply replace the entire system with something else. Um, and so generally, you're, you're really, your, your main option here is to, to do an AC coupled system with a battery inverter. Um, so long as, as there's some thought that the grid tie inverter that they have will AC couple adequately to the, to the battery inverter. And there are, there, there's a few there that, that are maybe iffy, uh, but most of them will work quite well. Uh, if it's an older grid tie inverter, it may be such that when you're off grid, the battery inverter will cause the, the grid tie inverter to turn on and off rather than back off on power. But that's really not a major deal. You still get your backup power, you still get some solar coming into the system. Um, you may need to modify the existing rapid shutdown system so that it doesn't turn off when the utility power goes off um, because that would sort of defeat the purpose. Um, and of course, you still have the same issue of, of compatibility between the grid tie inverter and the battery inverter with that. But um, that is, that's usually what people are looking for when they want to retrofit um, you know, energy storage to, a, to an existing system. Okay. Next, there we go. Now, you can also do backup power when you have a self-supply system. Um, you know, at, at first there were some systems in Europe and, and they started showing up here, uh, some of these um, self-supply type systems and they actually did not have backup power capability um, because in Europe, apparently they don't really see the need for that very much. Uh, but in, in this part of, in this country, uh, there is definitely a need for uh, backup power. Um, at least many people do see a need for backup power. And these self-supply systems uh, can also give you uh, backup power and are often used uh, for that purpose, even if they're primarily set up for self-supply. Um, you, you do still need to have a protected loads panel, <clears throat> generally. Uh, so because the even this type of inverter does still need to disconnect itself from the grid when there's a grid outage. Um, or you can do whole house backup and this sort of gives them the details that under the under the upcoming code um, they have a section um, where these um, self-supply systems, particularly the ones listed to UL9540, are now covered under section 706, which refers to section 710.15, which allows the inverter to have less capacity than the calculated loads. Now that is sort of an obscure little sentence, but what that means is that you can now have that inverter feeding the whole house, even if it can't power the whole house. See, under normal backup power requirements, um, the inverter is required to be able to back up all the loads that are on your backup loads panel. That's 702, I believe. Um, but now we have this, this means of, of using a smaller inverter that's just used for self-supply that can also be connected to power your whole house. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that the inverter probably cannot power your whole house. Um, so you have a choice and you have to be sort of careful here because um, you don't want a, a whole house backup system where the power goes off um, all the loads are suddenly connected to this small inverter and it can't handle it and it shuts off. And so your customer has a power outage, even if he has solar, um, until he manually goes and adjusts, you know, the circuits that he wants to power and then it comes back on and powers what he wants. It does give the, the flexibility of being able to power the loads that he wants, when he wants. Um, 
Now, some of these UL9540 systems, uh, self-supply systems, are now becoming available with a big 200 amp service entrance or transfer equipment. It, you know, an automatic backup unit or the big transfer unit or smart box or, you know, they're called various different things. But basically, it's a, a big 200 amp transfer switch <clears throat> and often has, excuse me, <clears throat> a lot of the logic uh, that can now manage, you know, when is the solar coming in? When is it disconnecting from the grid? When is it using this um, inverter power? Um, you know, when there's an outage and, and more and more, we're going to see these that also have load control. So that if you have excess solar, it can send it to certain loads. Um, if you're off grid, it can it turn off certain loads so that it can manage the load so that they are only um, as many loads as what the inverter can handle. Um, we're going to start seeing a lot of, of these sort of smart boxes that, that can do this. Not all of it's not all of them are available with this yet, but they're all working on it, and some are are available with a lot of this control. And also, some of these will have generator input, um, you know, so it can control when the generator runs, what the what the generator runs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this will this is sort of the direction that that things are going um, in the market. Um, if you do have a self supply system and you've sized it, you know, you need a certain amount of storage. Uh, to make that self-supply work well. Um, if you want to use it for backup power also, you may have to add a little more storage to it um, so that you have, you know, say you're at the, at the low point in the night, um, the battery's getting down to as much as you usually use for self-supply and the power goes out, you need to have some reserve there for your, your backup power. Um, so you may want to put a little bit more storage on these systems when they're used with uh, backup power. Okay. Next slide. There we go. So I'm just going to spend a little a couple of slides here just sort of on, on the different inverter types, <clears throat> sort of coming at this from a different direction. And um, I, there's, I think, there's a lot of confusion in the market about, you know, what to call different types of inverters. And I think people are sort of confused about what, what these different inverters are and what they do. Um, and, I, and so I'm, I'm sort of starting to, to push certain names for certain types of inverters. And I'll describe what those are here. Uh, the first one is the PV grid tie inverter. This is, you know, basically a box that converts your PV from DC to AC grid, that's your standard grid tie inverter. Uh, there's no storage capability. Um, and that's that's the one we're all familiar with. It could be micro inverters or it could be string inverters or even central inverters. And then there's <clears throat> battery inverters. These are the ones that we've known for, for years, even longer than grid tie inverters. These are the ones that simply take DC from a battery and convert it to AC to power loads. Uh, off-grid battery, off-grid inverters, um, and then somebody discovered that you can, with certain ones, you can actually feed power into the grid, backwards, back into the grid with these. Um, and that started the, the grid tie battery backup inverter. Uh, it's still a battery inverter. Uh, battery is required for them to operate um, because that is how they were originally designed. Listed the UL1741, common designation. Um, and then a few can do the grid tie. A lot of them are just simply a standalone inverter, but there are some that can do grid tie. They're fairly popular. They've been around for a while. Um, in these, the PV DC current goes into what's called a charge controller. And that charge controller then is in charge of feeding the charging the battery bank. <clears throat> the grid tie inverter will simply take uh, the voltage from that battery bank. And when it starts to rise above a certain voltage, it'll start feeding that power into the AC, into your loads, and then eventually into the grid. Um, and, and the more power, the more that voltage wants to rise, the more the grid tie inverter is, is pulling it out um, and pushing it into the AC to prevent the battery voltage from rising. That's how these work as a grid tie inverter. Uh, so you are always going from the solar through a charge controller to battery or at least the battery uh, circuit and then into the inverter and then into the grid. 
Um, these batter, these inverters can also be used in, for AC coupling, where you have the battery, it's running the inverter, uh, powering the loads, um, and then you can have your grid tie inverter sort of going through it. Um, you know, there's relays in it that when there's grid power available, it just sort of stays closed and the grid and it through to the loads is just all sort of one circuit. And the PV grid tie inverters will just feed through that to your loads and to the grid, just like it would normally without that inverter there. Um, that's the AC coupling. And then it really only comes into action when the utility uh, fails, when it drops off. And then your grid tie inverter will, I mean, your battery inverter will take over and become the grid that the grid tie inverter feeds. Um, you know, inverters that are this type, you know, the Outback Radian, the Outback VFXRs or FXRs, and the Schneider XW Pro. And there's um, a smattering of others. Um, that's, the, but that's, those are basically the, the grid tie battery inverters that are available you know, in the market in this country. Then there's the PV grid tie ESS. And ESS is a terminology that's used by the code um, and, and other people now. Um, and so the difference is that a PV grid tie ESS inverter is similar to a grid tie inverter, but it can also connect to a storage battery. And so this inverter can actually just be used as simply a, a grid tie string inverter. PV comes into the inverter and the inverter feeds it into the AC grid, into the AC loads and grid. There's no charge controller. The DC power does not go through the battery. Um, it just simply goes through, into the inverter and, and to the AC, just like a grid tie inverter. But it can also connect to a battery and some of them will connect to a, a higher voltage battery. So it's, the inverter sees it as just another input, like another solar array, or, but it's a battery bank instead. Um, some of them actually have a DC-DC conversion in it and will actually use a 48 volt battery bank. Uh, but still, the PV goes directly into the inverter and to the AC, not through a charge controller and, and not through the battery on its way to the inverter. Um, these are now generally being listed to UL 9540 as a system. So it's usually the inverter and the storage listed together as a pre-engineered system. Um, they are, they're virtually all, well, they are all as far as I know now, um, using lithium batteries. I don't know of any, there, there's some companies that are trying to do it with lead batteries, but they, they're not there yet. Um, I don't know that there's a UL test for that yet. Um, and lithium batteries were listed to UL 1973. Um, and lead batteries are not UL listed. They can be UL recognized sometimes, but they're not UL listed. Um, and so that's sort of putting a wrench in that. Um, just as a side note, um, your lithium batteries um, must should be listed to UL 1973. Uh, if you're looking at a lithium battery and they say it's listed to UL 1642, that is a cell listing. That is not a battery system listing. And you really want to make sure that your lithium batteries are listed to UL 1973 um, if you're going to use them in a code compliant system. Um, if, it's, if you have a system that's UL 9540, it is. You don't have to worry about it. It is. Um, inverters that, that are like this, uh, Generac, the PICA, uh, the Solar Edge Store Edge inverter with LG batteries. Um, and then soon the Solar Edge uh, Energy Hub, which would be the replacement for their storage, and the Outback Skybox are all this type of inverter. Next slide. Oops, we're running over, aren't we? Um, ESS grid tie. Um, this is very similar to what I was just talking about. But these are uh, inverters that are actually made to work only with batteries, not with solar. Um, they're also called an AC battery. So it's basically a battery with an inverter that feeds into the AC uh, without the PV. And then you have to use a PV grid tie inverter um, for the connecting the PV to this, generally through one of those big smart boxes or transfer switches. Um, and often, sometimes the, the PV inverter, the grid tie inverter will be the same brand as, as the um, the ESS, the grid tie, the battery and storage inverter, 
uh, you know, such as the uh, Sunny Boy Storage, Sunny Boy Inverter, same brand, all AC coupled together. And uh, some of the others are the end phase ensemble system with the end charge batteries are AC coupled, and, you know, with the end phase microinverters. And then, of course, the Tesla power wall is also an AC coupled um, system that um, can be used with other grid tie inverters. And I think we are back to Josh now. Awesome. Thank you, Brad. So there's a lot in there to unpack and I encourage you guys, um, if, you, if you ever have any questions on systems, reach out to us. We, we love talking about this stuff. Yeah, we love helping out. Um, yeah, one of the things I wanted to do at this point was, was to talk a little bit about, you know, trade-offs and segmentation and like along and, and really answer the question along which axes are we going to, are we going to segment our offer? You know, making a, making a three tier good, better, best offer based on, you know, the color of the inverter obviously that's a terrible way to do it but what's the right way to determine you know which one's good which one's better which one's best so um i've got a a, a marketing example here of you know how we create trade-offs and um you know the first is to consider different x-axes and, and almost almost all the time the y-axis is price you know so you're thinking about what what benefits or what features or you know what um characteristics are going to define the different offers and the, how, do, how do they how do they compare based on what kind of price people would pay for them uh, so the exercise here that, that I'm you know throwing out there is um, you know draw up some axes you know do some doodles think about um, you know to the extent you can a, a, a representative sampling of your customers in your area or your homeowners in your area and think about these different axes where would you plot the potential customers based on their needs and the perceived value so um, if, when we go through this exercise and we define the use case and, and we think about the platform, we're going to come back to, well, I, I could do almost anything. Like, I, I, you know, based on what Brad told us, we could have 40 different offers um, for storage in an area. Let's think about where the, the actual market is, though. So if you think about a, a representative sampling of the, the homeowners in your area, you know, try doing this. Try just plotting them on axes and, and use a dot for every, you know, 10 homeowners or 100 homeowners or whatever your scale is. Um, think about, you know, where the big concentrations of, of customers are going to be. Um, and then how do you create clusters to target those? So I've done kind of three examples here. One, uh, the first on the left where we're, you know, we're comparing the backup power, you know, KW needs versus price. Um, you know, on average, do you have um, one easy way to segment this is, you know, you're going to have some owners who insist on having, um, you know, the, the air conditioner on, uh, on a backup circuit. Well, you know, there's, there's a use case for that. Um, you're probably going to have a lot more who uh, aren't willing to pay that much, but, you know, they've got really critical loads they want to make sure are backed up. Uh, another another trade-off we can plot here is how much total storage need do your customers need? Um, you know, this could be, I think about this in terms of like days or hours of autonomy. Uh, and there's there's definitely some interactions with the, 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 the KW numbers on the left, but you know we could we can we can plot a bunch of homeowners and we can think about you know customers who are willing to um, you know they need uh, four hours of backup on a on a really small backup panel uh, that might be our, our red segmentation here. The orange might need you know eight hours. Um, you know your green folks might just insist that um, you know they want to be able to weather two days. So those might be systems where you're installing a lot of storage and maybe a generator in a connect. Uh, another possible trade-off um, segmentation here might be around cycling needs, um, which gets back to the, the use cases Brad was covering around um, time of use and what kind of you know, financial incentives and rates and tariffs are these customers on. Um, there's probably a whole, a whole clustering of people that have um, you know, very infrequent cycling needs, pure backup application where we're talking about three outages a year. Um, we've probably also got in that same territory some folks who want to do, you know, daily or multi-daily cycling and arbitrage. So um, this isn't to say that these are the three trade-offs that you that you should use, um, but I think if you if you go through a couple different of these exercises, you'll get a feeling for, you know, how do you how do you position the two or the three offers and and um, what's going to be important to the homeowners. Um, you know, beyond this stuff on the data sheet, how are you going to sell this and 
you know, what, what are the upsell opportunities going to be to get, to get more customers into the green, uh, into the green segmentation. So that's some thoughts on, on trade-offs and segmentation and defining that, you know, two or, or three step offer. Um, this next one, you, you know, going to give me a, hopefully you guys give me a, a little leeway here, but I call this marketing by Mad Libs. So this is an exercise you can do with creating a mission statement or creating your offers. Uh, you know, a lot of the marketing strategy stuff you're going to, you're going to, you know, do or, or have done in your company can, can really be worked out by this kind of, you know, fill in the blanks type format. Um, so for, uh, for the, you know, the, the setting of a, of a standardized solar plus storage offer, what I'm, what I'm proposing is we start with these fill in the blank sentences. Um, put myself in the position of you guys as a, as an installer, as a business owner. I think if I have a system that will provide, you know, X kW of backup power with Y amount of, of storage, kWh, that will or will not require daily cycling and, and can or cannot be figured as a retrofit. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm proposing this as a fill in the blank, really to kind of guide your thoughts on how do you narrow in on what that offer is. Uh, another, you know, the other solution in this hypothetical example is um, for homes that need more. So I, I'm basically proposing a, a, a two-tiered offer, you know, the, the entry-level offer and, the, and the, the upsell offer. So the upsell offer for homes that need more, um, you know, solar or power or storage or features, we're going to offer this, which will provide, you know, XKW of backup power, um, YKW of, or excuse me, Y amount of, of storage. And then you still got to answer those questions on, on daily cycling and retrofit. If you can work through this in such a way that you're, um, you know, you're making, you're making sentences that are fill in the blank, uh, I think this will lead you to a more objective uh, definition of what that offer should be. And I think a lot of the times where folks get hung up on what, what should I offer? What should the storage package be for this area? You know, you go to what you know, you research those brands, and it's, it's really hard to suss out once you're down that rabbit hole. Um, is, is this the right offer for, you know, for my territory? Or is this the proverbial, I've got a hammer, therefore everything looks like a nail? If you start with like fill in the blanks, you know, no brands and just objectives, um, you know, you'll end up with, I think, a more, um, a more concrete understanding of what's going to be the right fit for your area. So I've, I've come up with some hypothetical examples and, you know, feel free to read these at your leisure. Um, some of the thoughts in, in terms of like, you know, how to prep for this exercise. How do you, how do you hit most of the market? If this were like a, a bell curve or another kind of frequency distribution, what are the really fat parts of the market you want to target? Uh, think about those, you know, think about how do I make one size fits most and not worry about, you know, hitting every single dot in that segmentation graph. Um, so hopefully this is good kind of marketing, marketing food for thought. Um, at this point, you know, I'm, we're going to speak briefly to this storage portfolio. Um, we put this slide together because there's a ton of different offers and solutions out there. And it's, it's really hard to get, you know, some really objective facts and figures uh, all in one place. So that, that's the goal of this slide. And you can read through the, the different offers that we've got stocked and available um, and really what they're well suited for. You know, you see a number of these that are AC coupled only, a number of these that are DC coupled only, a number of these that are really flexible. Um, some are generator capable, et cetera. Um, and we've, we've tried to lay this out objectively and, and as fact-based as we can. Um, you know, one thing that I'll point out here is some of these offers, some of these solutions are really specialized and they do, you know, one or two things extremely well. Um, others like, you know, um, Radian or XW Pro, these are, these are Swiss Army knives that can do any number of things. Now, a Swiss Army knife is great when you want to have one thing in your pocket that can do almost everything. Um, but sometimes you don't come <laughs> in just about every installation I've seen installers are trying to do one or two things at a time and not everything. So uh, I say that to say, if you've got, you know, if, if you go through this exercise and you find that um, I need to have three offers, but I can get them all with one platform and one brand. Hey, more power to you. Let's do that. Um, but don't, I guess there's always the right tool for the job. And sometimes the right tool for the job is just a very simple screwdriver with nothing else attached. Um, 
yeah, so we'll we'll leave it at that. Um, this slide, as long as well as all of the others, will be available to you uh, at the end of the webinar, provided you you fill out our survey. Please fill that out. We're always looking for good feedback on how we did. Was it relevant? Did it answer your questions? Kind of what more are you looking for? Um, which at this point, uh, I'm going to advance the slide, and you know we've got some time to to answer questions and and take some some input from the field. I, I do recognize we've gone a little over our time slot today and hopefully folks can stick around for some Q&A. Um, for those that can't, fill out the survey. We'll send the, uh, we'll send the slides out to you and we'll post this to our AE YouTube channel as well, which while, while, Jamie, uh, while Jamie gets back on and looks up some questions, I did want to point out a lot of what we've covered today, um, AC versus DC coupling, um, what's the right, you know, what's the right battery for your needs, a lot of this stuff's covered in, in webinars we've done over the past one to two years. So I encourage you to reference back to there. Um, I like having YouTube videos on when I'm doing kind of, you know, busy work, et cetera. Maybe you do too. And if, uh, if my voice and tone isn't too off-putting, you know, good way to go back and, and see what you missed. So Jamie, we'll, we'll open it back up for, for some Q&A. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Josh. I appreciate that. So yeah, we only have we have a few questions that came through, um, as well as uh, quite a few comments saying that this was uh, very beneficial and helpful to them, and and uh, they're looking forward to being able to review this on YouTube because there's just a lot of information there. So yeah, uh, yes. Yeah, thank you both for the presentation. Um, I've got a question coming in from John. Uh, he's asking, how does solar plus storage work? With a generator, um, so I can I can handle this one. Um, and the answer to that is, well, it depends. Uh, it depends on the technology you're using. But uh, you know, essentially, where we see this most uh, is with battery inverters that have a secondary uh, AC input. Uh, so you have a, a second set of AC inputs that, uh, in some cases, have wider you know voltage and frequency tolerance windows. Um, in some cases, just have adjustable parameters. Um, and most of these systems will use a, um, um, an add-on or an ancillary generator inner control, basically um, a control module that's going um, to activate the generator when you get to pre-specified you know, low battery cutouts, um, and it's going to treat that as an AC source. Um, using a generator in this way, uh, you know, I'm in the solar business, but uh, even if I weren't, I would probably still recommend having having storage paired with the generator just because it's going to allow the generator to operate more efficiently. Um, you know, if you can operate a generator for, say, you know, three hours a day at an 80 percent duty cycle, it's a much better application than having one run for, for 12 hours a day at a 30 percent duty cycle. Um, so that's a very short answer to how to how these systems utilize a generator. Excellent. I've got another question that came in. It seems it's it's a it's very product specific or system specific from Michael. I have a Magnum Energies PAE4448 with six 250 watt modules. What grid type inverter should be used? I can get that one. Well, <clears throat> um, you could use any uh, a number of grid tie inverters. Um, you know, end phase. Uh, Sunny Boy, um, store, uh, Solar Edge. Um, you do have to be aware that you have a limitation uh, how much, how, what the capacity of that grid tie inverter is in relation to the capacity of the, the battery inverter. Uh, in the case of Magnum, um, I think they don't want you to go over about uh, 90%. So with a 4448, you'd be limited to probably a 3.8 kilowatt grid tie inverter or circuits that add up to about 3.8 kilowatts. Um, and then you have control issues um, with the Magnum. Um, you do, it has frequency shift, but it has a very, very wide hysteresis. Um, and so you'd probably also want a relay that, that turns the inverter on and off, um, but you, that they don't have an auxiliary necessarily on theirs um, unless you use the ARTR. So there's 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 details to, to work out there and and of course if you use multiple inverters you can use you know larger grid tie inverters but it, uh, it can be done and, and it's done quite often. Great thanks I, I think we have we have time for one more here I've um, this one came in from Glenn I live in an area hmm. 
where we use 50, uh, 50 hertz. Uh, not Arglen, sorry. <laughs> I live in an area ah, where, we, okay. <laughs> where we use 50 hertz. Is there any challenge with using any of your solutions? We use 230 by 115 volt. Most people have 220 by 120, 60 hertz appliances. Mm -hmm. Grid is 2030 over 115. Yeah, I can I can take this one, Brad. Um, and thanks for your question, Glenn. Um, the short answer is that you know most of the platforms we've talked about today um, have a have an international let's call it version, uh, 230 volt, 50 hertz. Um, just based on the customers that we typically serve, we don't we don't stock any of that material. Um, it may be available for us to order and, and ship to you, um, but as you point out, you know different voltage, different frequency, different interconnection. Um, the, the, just about all Brad of the solutions we carry are going to have split phase, um, line, line one, line two, and a neutral connection. Um, and I believe the terminals on the 230 volt 50 Hertz equipment are going to be, um, basically just one line and one neutral. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. Um, so the short answer is no, they won't work, but you know, folks like Enphase and Outback and Schneider and, and you name it, they sell globally. So some of this equipment may be available for us to order for you and, and we'd love to work with you offline on doing so. Great, awesome. Well, we are uh, about 10 minutes over. I appreciate everybody hanging in there with us and uh, um, you guys, uh, Brad and Josh, thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. So as a, uh, as Josh had mentioned, um, there will be a survey that pops up at the end. We we really do read every one of your comments, and um, we uh, we use your that information to help kind of guide uh, us as to what types of uh, content and information you're interested in. So um, go ahead and fill that out. It'll just take a minute or so, and uh, I will um, we we will be processing this and uh, getting the deck over to those of you that do take the time to fill it out and uh, also getting this up to our YouTube channel next week. So um, thank you for that. And then of course, next Friday at 9 a.m. same time, we're going to uh, follow up with the second part of this series um, with actually uh, you know, some, some uh, more direct information as to selling the, the solar with storage. So thank you, Brad and Josh, for your time today. And uh, thank you all for uh, joining us. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks.